Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, incident response um, is what we're going to be talking about today, and that's basically uh, the, the series of activities that you go through. If you think a machine is infected with some kind of malware, you want to figure out what that malware is done, um, you know, where it's installed on the machine, uh, where it came from, you know, all that kind of stuff. And this is really important, um, not just for businesses, but for techs who are, you know, servicing individual consumers' machines, um, people who are managing lots of machines, uh, really anybody who's in this space. So we're going to talk today about how Catalina is going to affect your ability to do these kinds of activities. Uh, just a little bit about me. First of all, my name's Thomas Reed. I work for Malwarebytes. Uh, and if you are in the back of the room, I, I do have some code on some of these slides. It may or may not be easy to read. So if you want, you can just download the slides right now and you know follow along with me. They're on github.com slash Thomas A. Reed. Um, so you'll find the presentations up there. So let's jump on in. Um, so not long ago, I, I was, uh, oops, hit the button. Not long ago, there, oh, there we go. Uh, I was writing these Python scripts for incident response. And I was all ready to go. I was all excited. I've got these new scripts. They're great. I love them. And Apple comes along and says, hey, by the way, everybody, we're getting rid of Python in the future. So it's like, crap, well, what do I do now? Um, so the scripts are up there on, on GitHub, but in the future, they're not going to be very useful. You know, when you're doing incident response, the last thing that you want to do is go to the, the machine and do something like, you know, homebrew install, you know, whatever. You know, you don't want to mess up the machine. You know, when, that's kind of like if you were an investigator going into a crime scene and you've got mud all over your shoes and you just track it all over the place and you're touching stuff with no gloves on your hands. And you, you know, you get the idea. So what do we do? You know, this is a problem. And this got me thinking, you know, well, what else am I going to have to think about when Catalina comes along? So... Before we talk about Catalina, let's talk about some other things that Apple has done. So I've got a sequence of slides here titled A Brief History of Apple-Induced Pain. A little bit of complaining here, but sort of to set the story that this is always changing. So if we go back as far as Snow Leopard, um, Apple had introduced the App Store for the first time. and well, on the Mac for the first time. And because an App Store app has no way to set persistence, or at least didn't at the time, um, what they did is they provided this method where you embed a helper app inside your, your App Store app, uh, you uh, register it with the service management framework, and it, that process will start at login which is really great if you write an App Store app and you want something persistent when, it, you know, when the user logs in. The problem is there's no way to really easily enumerate all these. You, know, it's, there's, you can't just go to the login items list and say, oh, look, there's this one. You can't go and enumerate all the launch agents and daemons. This isn't in a single place. So basically, you have to look at every single application on the system and see if there's a login item inside that app bundle. Um, so that's kind of a pain, and it makes figuring out what's persistent on the system a little harder. Fast forward, a couple of releases here to Sierra, um, and Apple decided to deprecate all the old Unix-style logs, uh, which are they're technically not supposed to be there anymore, but some of them still are. Some of them are still getting written to. I don't really know what the pattern is, which ones are supported, which ones aren't. Um, but Apple's moved towards unified logging now. And unified logging is great. You know, don't get me wrong, I think it's great. It's got a lot of really good information. Um, but you have to learn a new way of accessing that data. 
Um, you can't just use your old existing incident response scripts that grab the log files. You have to figure out how to access unified logs. And then you've also got the added problem that these can be huge. It's a fire hose. So you might be able to very easily grab everything in var log. But if you want to grab all the unified logs, uh, I did that at one point on my uh, machine, and the dump of those logs was something like um, 800 megabytes. It was close to a gigabyte. That's a lot of data to pull off of a, an infected endpoint, especially remotely, you know, if you're trying to do this remotely. So it adds a little bit of extra headache and some changes. Hi Sierra made another change here. So like I mentioned, persistence is something you really want to be looking at with incident response. And before, you could just grab the com.apple.loginitems.plist preference file, and it would you know, really nicely enumerate all the login items on the system. And here we're talking about the ones that are set up in the users and groups preference pane. Well, in High Sierra, Apple decided that's not secure, um, so they deprecated that. The file is still there, but if you look at it, you'll notice that it's not up to date. You know, if you have it on your system, it's, it's not actually the current login items. It might be outdated. It's now in this other file that is more opaque. It's no longer an open uh, plist file, it's a, it's a binary file, and you, there's no, not really any documented method for reading these. Um, Patrick Wardle, if you know who that is, uh, he actually has a, a good blog post on the technical ways of reading these files through Objective-C, um, but you know, if you're not up to the task of writing Objective-C code, you're going to have a hard time getting this data. Um, the easiest way to get it, fortunately, kind of still works, but it's got, there are some complicating factors, and that is through AppleScript. But of course, as we're going to learn soon, AppleScript is a problem on Catalina as well. So um, if we forward to Mojave, we've got TCC, or Transparency Consent and Control. Um, and this controls access to certain parts of the file system, and as I mentioned, access to AppleScript. So if you want to be able to say, um, you know, tell system events, tell application system events to get the path of all, of every login item, I think that's the, the script you use. That doesn't work automatically anymore. You're gonna trigger a user prompt that says, do you want whatever script this is to control system events? And um, so it makes it a little bit harder for us to get the information that we need in some ways. Um, and now, moving up into Catalina, we've got this additional requirement of notarization, uh, which I think this is great. You know, this is not really a big problem, but you just have to be aware that if you're going to give somebody a, an app of some kind, whether this is an Apple script applet or some custom app that you've written in Objective-C or Swift, you're going to have to notarize that thing. You can't just code sign it and hand it over. That's not good enough anymore. Um, so uh, in our case at Malwarebytes, you know, we have, so we have a script that, well, multiple scripts that are all uh, written in Apple script that we give to customers when, when we need them to you know, gr gather some basic information. And so now we have to notarize those, otherwise they get these scary messages about, you know, how, um, you know, it can't be open because Apple cannot check it for malicious software. And technically, if you're sitting there at the machine, you can just control click open uh, and you bypass this. But that's not something you really want to ask an end user to do. So let's start out, let's talk about some of the ways around this. Um, so we're going to start off with TCC, which was introduced in Mojave, and you can kind of get an idea here of what I think one of the problems with TCC is. Um, you know, it's, it's got a real problem with dialogue fatigue for the end user, they, and, and as a result of seeing so many dialogues, they're just going to be like, yes, just get out of my way, 
click, 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 okay. Okay, now I can get back to work. So I don't know if the audio will actually work on this or not. We'll, we'll give this a shot. Um, uh, probably if you're in the back, you can't hear that. But we'll, we'll go ahead and skip ahead. You get the idea. That was Apple's ad poking fun at Vista, uh, where everything was, you know, cancel or allow. Um, and now Apple has gone down that exact same road. And I, I get why they did. I, I do understand, but I don't think the constant barrage of dialogues is the best way to go. So how does this affect IR? Well, we already mentioned, you know, if you're giving something to an end user and you want them to run it to gather some information, uh, you're going to get stuff like this. You're going to have, uh, uh, you know, like Apple script uh, uh, authorization requests. You're going to have requests to authorize access to parts of the file system. And the end user is going to need to know that, know, know that they need to allow it. Um, worse is if you're doing this remotely. So say you're sitting in your office in um, Santa Clara and you need to look at the machine of somebody who thinks they're infected in New York. Well, you don't want to drive to New York or fly to New York. You don't want them to have to package up their machine and mail it to you. So you're probably going to want to SSH in and do some things remotely. Problem is, you might trip over TCC. And so your ability to gather the data you need may be hampered, especially if there's nobody sitting there at the machine to click OK when your script triggers one of these things. Um, so if you're doing remote IR, what you really are going to need to do is you're going to need to deploy a privacy preferences policy control payload, which is a mouthful. So PPPCP, <laughs> for short. Um, so how exactly do you do this? Um, and, and why do you do it? Well, first of all, for, for, as we mentioned, full disk access as well as um, uh, scripting capabilities. Those are the two things you really need for your scripts. Well, maybe not the scripting. It depends on what your script is. Um, if it calls OSA script or if it's built in Apple script, you're going to need it. Um, and you, you, like I said, you don't have somebody sitting there to click the button. So the easiest way to do this, if you don't know, if you've never done this before, is to use a script called tccprofile.py. Um, and this was made by Carl Ashley. It's uh, up on GitHub, free to download and use. Uh, and this will generate the profiles for you. You just have to tell it what to generate. Um, and I'm not going to go into full and complete detail here, uh, but there is a very nice walkthrough from Rich Troughton. Um, so you can just go there. It will walk you through the process of, of using this, uh, and you deploy your, you, know, you create your profile and deploy it through your MDM. So let's look at some of the details, not, not necessarily you know, exactly how you deploy this and whatnot, but what do you actually need to allow? So we're assuming here that you're going to remote in through something like SSH. So assuming SSH, uh, you're going to need for SSHD an SSHD keygen wrapper to have full disk access. Now, technically, I've done some, some playing around with this. The system doesn't seem to care if SSHD has full disk access. It only cares if SSHD keygen wrapper has full disk access. Um, so it's, I don't know why. It seems like it should be the other way around, but that's the way it works. If you give SSHD keygen wrapper full disk access, you'll be able to list the contents of whatever directory you want. Um, so that's, you've got you've to create a, a profile that will give that access. Uh, also, it seems like that already has that access by default uh, on Catalina. So if, you, if you've set up sharing, if you've set up uh, remote login, uh, SSHD keygen wrapper is going to have full disk access by default. 
but just in case that gets disabled somehow, either by the user or by another admin, it's still a good idea to have that in your profile. Then you also, if you're using AppleScript at all, you're going to want to also add an AppleScript, one or more AppleScript um, items to your profile. So basically, these are the app A is allowed to control app B through AppleScript. Uh, and again, SSHD keygen wrapper is the one that needs the permission, not SSHD, for whatever reason. So there's your OSA script right there for getting your login items uh, that will trigger one of these prompts. If you have given SSHD keygen wrapper the ability to control systemevents.app, this will never pop up on the endpoint and your script will just work. So the basic idea of how you generate this profile, uh, you can do this, you can use this tccprofile.py script uh, without any parameters and it'll pop up a nice little GUI that'll let you enter values. If you wanna do it through the command line, you use all files, which will allow F, uh, full disk access or FDA, um, and you use the Apple event flag to give uh, uh, to specify uh, app pairs. So basically, you know, one app that does the controlling and the other app that is controlled. Uh, and there's a nice help for tccprofile.py that will tell you about all the different command line flags. So the basic idea, we're going to walk through it kind of fast because if you want more details, you can go find it on Der Flounder on Rich Troughton's site. Well, you call TCC profile. You pass it all files, and you're going to be passing the path here to SSHD keygen uh, wrapper. Then Apple event, you want to pass, this is a comma delimited list, so you give it the path to SSHD keygen wrapper, which is the app that will do the controlling, a comma, and then the path to system events.app, which is the app that will be controlled. So that says this, you know, Keygen wrap, SSHD keygen wrapper can control system events. And then you specify allow, which basically says, yeah, th these are allowed, not denied. Payload description can be whatever you want. Just make it something descriptive so you know what it is. Uh, payload identifier, again, can be whatever you want. And these are supposed to be unique. But you don't have to worry about that because TCC Profile will append a UUID, a randomly generated UUID, so it will guarantee that your identifier is unique. And then payload name, again, can be anything you want. Payload org, anything you want, although it makes sense for it to be your company name. And finally, use the dash O flag to specify an output file. You output to a mobile config file, deploy that through your MDM, and you're all set. Your scripts are going to be good to go on that machine once that's deployed. So on Catalina with the new notarization requirement, uh, if you're deploying anything that's an app, and this includes Apple Script or Automator applets, you're going to have to notarize it. So how do you do that? Well, if you're writing code in Swift or Objective-C, it's pretty easy. You know, Apple's got good documentation on how to do this. You basically have to enable hardened runtime in that app that you're developing, and you have to sign it. You've got to have the right certificates, and, and you've got to code sign it. And then there are a few other things you have to do. Xcode will take care of it all for you. It'll take care of the notarization, um, and you're good. So if you're doing it that way, it's easy. If you're writing Apple Script or Automator applets, then you've got a problem, because Apple doesn't really tell you how to do this for, for those kinds of apps. Um, they don't say, Here's the direct, here are the directions for how to do the notarization manually for an Apple Script app. Um, fortunately, it is possible. Um, the, you know, the lack of documentation doesn't mean it's not possible. Um, command line is going to be um, pretty much a must for at least part of the process. 
and there are some hidden requirements and corner cases that you're going to run into. So, when you're doing this, the first th there, there's a sequence of steps you're going to have to do. Um, first of all, and this is assuming, uh, this may or may not apply if, uh, because when you build an app in AppleScript or Automator, you can optionally code sign it right from the export window. If you do that, you don't have to worry about the first two steps because that's already done. The problem is if somebody else is maintaining the app and then they send it to you to sign, that's where the problems come in. There are extended attributes that are added to the AppleScript applets, and CodeSign does not like those. It will not sign the app because of those extended attributes. So the first thing you've got to do is strip all those off. Second thing you do is code sign, um, and you need to use the deep flag for that, otherwise it's not going to work. Third step is actually do the notarization, and this is where you upload this to Apple, and they do whatever opaque thing they do to scan for malware. We don't really know what that is. Uh, and then they either give you a notarization or not. And then once you've gotten the notarization, once that's complete, then you can staple it, uh, which, you know, basically it's kind of, I don't know why they said staple and not stamp. You know, you're a notary, you stamp things, you don't staple them, but, you know, whatever the case. Um, and then finally, once that's all done, you can zip it and distribute it however you want. So um, full details, again, uh, I've referred again to Rich Troughton's site. He's got a really, really good walkthrough here. Um, I highly recommend that. Uh, there's also a little corner case here where maybe your Apple ID, your developer ID, is actually associated with more than one developer account. So my personal developer ID, I mean, it's just me. There's nobody else. You know, that's not a problem. My Malwarebytes ID, though, We've got a couple different signing identities, and my ID is associated with both of them. So I have to specify which one of those I want to notarize with. Um, and that's, that adds an additional wrinkle that most people may not see, but if you do, it'll stop you in your tracks. So I've got some documentation here on how you deal with that problem. So, for an example, I mentioned we've got some scripts that we send out to customers. Um, it's called MBST, Malwarebytes Support Tool. Um, so, in order to send that out, you know, our support team maintains the script. When they make a change, they send it over to me, and I've got to, you know, review it and then sign it and notarize it. Um, so. Basically, what I do here is very simple. I use XATTR to strip off those extended attributes, do the code signing through the co command line. Um, then you've got to zip the file. You've got to zip the app up uh, so that you can upload it. Um, the next step is XCRUNAL tool. That's the command that actually uploads it for notarization. And there are a few things you've got to provide here. So you've got to provide um, a primary bundle ID, which I'm not exactly sure what that's supposed to be. I kind of assumed, yeah, Greg's got. It turns out people can be arbitrary. Okay, that's what I that's what I had come to realize. Something yeah. Yeah, and I noticed that because. I erroneously used the wrong, like I was trying to use the bundle ID for the applet every time, and I erroneously used the wrong one for an app at one point, and I was like, wait, that worked? Why did that work? <laughs> so it really doesn't seem to matter what you use there. Your username, uh, you know, that's got to be the username for your Apple developer ID. The password is not the password for your developer, for your Apple ID. So don't put your password there. What you have to do there is you go to appleid.apple.com and there's a place there where you can generate an app-specific password. You do that um, and, and you'll get a password you can use for, for notarization purposes. Um, so you put that password in here. 
you probably are not going to need the ITC provider. That's, I need that because my ID is associated with two different signing identities, so I have to specify which one I'm using. And then finally, you give it the path to the file you want to upload. Now, once that is complete, and it'll spit a whole bunch of stuff out into your, your terminal, um, and it makes it a little difficult to tell whether it was successful or not, but assuming it was successful, don't jump to the next step yet, because it actually hasn't been successful yet. It's just been uploaded successfully. Apple still has to do their, their thing on their end, and they will send you an email when it's all complete and you're ready to go. Um, so once you get that email, you can go on to this last step here of XC Run Stapler to staple the ticket to the app. And you don't need a ticket. You don't need to go somewhere and download a ticket that you can you know, provide a path to or something like that. Apple knows what the ticket is. They've got a record of it in their system. So this basically just gets the ticket from Apple and staples it to the app. And the reason this is necessary, uh, you don't actually need to do that if the system has an internet connection. As long as you've done this step and it's been notarized, you're good to go. The problem comes in when the system that's running the app is offline. If there's no network connection, it can't go online and see that there's a ticket associated with that app, so it's going to fail. So that's why this last step here is necessary. You staple the ticket to the app, and then it'll even work offline. Now, let's move on beyond Catalina. And uh, Apple has, as multiple people, including Greg, have mentioned at the conference to, you know, the last couple days, uh, sometime, probably the next version after Catalina, uh, Apple's going to pull scripting languages out. Python, Perl, uh, Ruby, those are the ones that were named. We don't know if, you know, Bash is probably going to come out at some point too. We don't know when. But um, So how do you deal with that? Because a lot of the scripts that we use for IR have been built in Python. You know, I, I've got scripts in Python. Um, there's, uh, Richie Cyrus has uh, some scripts he just recently released called Venator. Um, there's AutoMacTC or AutoMacTick, however you say that. Um, OSX Collector. There are a lot of different Python-based incident response scripts out there. So what do we do in a post-Catalina world when these scripting languages get ripped out? Well. Got a shout out to Greg that I added yesterday after his talk. Um, so you can actually use Python standalone, we think, anyway. I mean, obviously we can't test this yet because we don't have a system without Python. But I did a little bit of testing after his talk yesterday and you can just make a standalone um, version of Python. You should be able to put that on a USB flash drive with your scripts, use that to run your scripts, and you're good. Or you could you know, deploy it to a machine um, remotely and then run it through SSH. Uh, so that should work in theory. We, you know, obviously, we'll need to test that once a system without Python is available, but should work. So maybe you don't have to actually do anything. But maybe you don't want to rely on that. So what else can you do? Well, you can rewrite your scripts as shell scripts. Um, you know, shell scripts are going to be around. Bash, maybe not. You know, there are some signs that it may be going away, but certainly you can rewrite in Z shell. Um, you know, you can rewrite in whatever shell is still around. Um, sometimes parsing the data is a little less convenient than the shell, in my experience. I don't know, maybe some shell experts. A little less convenient. Also, I don't like the code that I write in shell scripts. It's it's a little primitive. You don't have classes. It's it's a little bit more difficult to read. Um, you could also rewrite some of these scripts in Apple Script. And um, the nice thing about Apple Script is it's a very readable language, 
And on top of that, it can actually run shell scripts for things that it can't do directly. You just do, do shell script um, and put in your script, and that, that works really nicely. The big problem with Apple Script is it's slow. So you've got to factor that in. You could also rewrite your scripts as mock O binaries. Um, so this is something that's written in Objective-C or Swift. Um, I'm not going to say something like C or something like that because you don't want to go there. <laughs> um, but you know, if you write something in Objective-C or Swift, it's really easy to um, get the data you need and you know, you're directly supported. You can code sign it, you can notarize it. Um, you know, you've got everything you need. Uh, the biggest problem with this is that there can be a high learning curve. If you don't know Objective-C or Swift, it can, it, it can seem like a big cliff to climb. Um, in practice, I've found I don't know Swift all that well, but I know a lot of other languages, and a, I've done a little bit of um, playing around with Swift, and it's fairly easy to write a command line tool in Swift as long as you know the basics of Swift and can do a little Googling while you're writing your code, it's not that bad. So, so let's take a look at a concrete example. So one of the things you would probably want to do as part of incident response is get information about files on the system. So one of the things I really like to do is just iterate over every file on the system and get some basic information, things like the, the various timestamps, creation date, modification date, access date. Um, I like to get permission information, flags, size of the file, uh, that sort of thing. So these are all some basic, pretty easy things to gather. Um, and we're gonna look at how you can gather this kind of information through a variety of different languages. So in Python, this is the way that I wrote all this stuff first in my scripts, because they're Python. Um, you can use the os.stat command. So all you've got to do is import os in your Python script, and you've got access to this command. You just do um, os.stat, give it a path to whatever file you want to look at, and it will give you back this nice data structure that you can access individual elements of. Um, and there are things in there like you can do s the, access the um, statinfo.st flags, and that gives you uh, an integer that e each bit in there has a specific meaning, is a specific flag, and so you can look at that and you can see, well, is, it, you know, is, it, is this hidden? Is it um, maybe user, uh, 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 what is it, uh, user basically locked? Um, you know, what, what are the flags on this file? You can also use this st mode uh, uh, variable there, the value there. That is uh, a combination of the permissions and the file type. So you know when you do an ls uh, in the, the terminal um, and you get all the, the information like you know what the various permissions are, or whether it's a directory or a file, that sort of thing, that's what we're talking about. And it really makes most sense if we display this in octal, which is really easy in Python. Um, and so you can see the 755 there, that's the if you've ever done used chmod on the terminal, um, that's those are those are the numbers you would use there, and then the first three digits are uh, it's it represents the file type, uh, and there are a number of different values that you can find there, and then finally you can use um, statinfo.st birth time to get the creation date now. One uh, interesting point here is there's actually an ST creation date or created date. I forget the exact name. Don't use that one. It's wrong. Might be right sometimes, but I've seen it be the modification date other times. So 
this birth time value is always the correct creation date. Um, and when you're doing this, when you're grabbing a date in incident response scripts, you generally want UTC because, you know, where, where is this machine? Is it in New York? Is it in California? Did whoever has it, are they traveling? Are they in Paris? Um, I don't know what time zone it's in. I don't want to know what time zone it's in. So if I can convert all the timestamps to UTC, then I have a universal representation of when a particular event happened on that machine. And that's really useful, especially when you're correlating between many different log files. So here we're gonna really easily convert this um, ST birth time into a UTC date for display. So really easy, not, not a lot of lines of code there. So let's take a look at how we do this in the shell. You're basically gonna use exactly the same thing, the stat command in the shell, but you don't, it, it, there are a couple of ways you can use it. One is you just use it by itself and it'll just sort of spit out a long string with all the values in it, which could be useful, but it's also a little difficult to parse. Uh, and, and it, you know, it's, if you want a UTC time, that's not the time you're gonna get in that data. Um, you can also use these formatting strings. So like percent %f here will give you the flags. That's the same value we got in Python. Um, percent %p will give you the permission data. So that's the same number we got from Python again in octal. And then percent %b, capital B, gives you the birth time. So we can get that and we can convert it with this command into a UTC time for display. And that's pretty easy too, but sometimes these formatting instructions are not really adequate for what you wanna do. So it may be sometimes be a little more cumbersome to deal with these values in, in a shell script. What about AppleScript? AppleScript is really easy to maintain. You don't really need to be a big techie to maintain this, this stuff. But it's really slow. If you want to enumerate every file on the system with an Apple script, you might as well go have lunch and maybe dinner, um, maybe breakfast too. Um, it's going to be really slow. Uh, also, access to some of this basic data is just not good in Apple script. It's not native. Um, so you can get some of this information natively in Apple script, but for a lot of it, you're going to be calling a shell script anyway. So you're kind of uh, not getting the full benefit of using Apple script anyway if you're sh calling out to a shell script. Um, also, I kind of had a little bit of trouble here. If we go back, you'll notice the time here is in UTC 0550. So 5.50 a.m. In AppleScript, for some reason, when I tried to get that value and convert it to UTC, it tells me 4.50 a.m. I have no idea why. So basically, if you're going to be doing this kind of stuff with AppleScript, don't waste your time. It's just not going to work. It's not going to go your way. Some things you can do in AppleScript, but don't try this. What about Swift? So it, it, I think a lot of people who have never programmed in something like Objective-C or Swift before think, oh, well, just to write a simple program, I've got to write all this code. That's not the case. This is a complete program here that will output all the same values that we've been looking at. Um, so here you, oops, wrong button, sorry. So. The one thing you've got to make sure you do is import Darwin. That gives you access to that same stat command. Um, so you can do, use this stat command to get that same stat structure that you would get in Python, and then you just look at all the values. So here we can um, print out the stat uh, st flags. It's exactly the same name that's used in Python and it outputs exactly the same number of the flags that we got for that file. 
for the mode, the, the permissions. You get that same field name and you output it with a radix of eight that basically converts it to a an octal representation of the number in a string. Um, and it gives you exactly the same number we got for, from Python. And then it takes a couple lines here, but you get the birth time and you convert that into UTC and it gives you exactly the same date and time, 5.50 a.m. So no problems like in Apple Script. And this was easy. I mean, it's what this is, if you don't count the import statements, it's only seven lines of code. So, and that includes the three print statements. So it's, it's really not as hard as it might seem to write this kind of code in Swift. And it will be native, it will be fast. You basically just copy an executable, a single file executable over to the system you want to analyze and run it and give it whatever parameters you want and you can get whatever data you need. So this is a really nice option. So what is the verdict here? Um, there's, uh, there's no one right answer to what you should do here. Um, for quick and dirty stuff where you're just, you just need to write something quick and you want it to be quick and just give you a result, a shell script is a really easy way to go. You know, you, if you know shell scripting at all, you can write one of these without a lot of um, tech, deep technical knowledge. Um, and it, it, shell scripts are fast, you know, you, uh, for the most part. I mean, obviously anything can have its advantages and disadvantages, but for the most part, shell scripts are gonna run pretty fast. Um, and, and they're easy to maintain. Plus, you don't have to worry about notarizing these or code signing these. Um, you would just have to worry about does terminal or whatever other process I'm using to run this script have the necessary permissions? Does it have full disk access? Does it have Apple scripting capabilities if I'm calling OSA script? Um, so you've got you've to look at, look at that, but that's really the only messy detail here. For a more long-term, full-featured solution, so like if I want to go and say, well, I've just written all these Python scripts to do some very sophisticated data collection, what do I want to do with those? Well, I would want to rewrite those in Swift. So, um, and that's what I am actively doing with my Python scripts is I am working on converting all of that over into, uh, into native Swift uh, and compiling that to a binary. And that's gonna be fast, it's gonna be powerful, uh, and I, you, can, you can actually end up doing a lot more than you would be able to in a shell script or Python or anything else. So, um, as your technical ability in Swift grows, you can really do some very powerful things here. And then for, I, I kind of, uh, you know, I, I badmouthed Apple Script a little bit here when I was talking about how to get the file information. But don't get me wrong, Apple Script still has its place. Apple Script and Automator can be very powerful tools. The nice thing about these is that you do not have to be an expert. You don't have to know Swift. You don't have to even know anything about the shell if you don't need, you don't want to. Um, so we have folks at Malwarebytes that maintain our uh, Apple script that we send out to customers. So when, when there's a problem, when somebody thinks they're infected and we wanna gather some basic IR information from them, we send them one of these scripts. And I'm not the one maintaining those scripts. I don't have to worry about it. I can let somebody in customer support worry about that um, sometimes they'll ask me for technical advice on certain aspects of it, but um, I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to maintain those. All I have to do is make sure they're working properly and then sign and notarize them. Um, so there's a really big advantage there for those. And also the fact that it is a native app that an end user can double click, that's really nice. It's a really, really powerful thing. Um, you know, you can't really give an end user a shell script and say, yeah, 
take this, go into the terminal, run it with sudo. They aren't going to have any idea. And they're, you know, I've, I've seen people attempt it and screw it up and then and bork their systems. So you want to stay away from that. So an Apple script applet can have its place in, in incident response. And uh, so basically we have a few takeaways here. First of all, you really are going to have to understand TCC and the implications. Uh, and you have to, in the post-Catalina world, know how to deploy PPPCPs. Um, we're not going to go back into what that means again, because I don't know if I'd get it right. <laughs> Just remember PPPCPs. <laughs> um, what, if you know how to do that, you're going to be golden. Um, you also need to notarize everything that will, that will get run by a less technical user. You know, as a technical user, you know how to bypass it if you need to, but a less technical user won't. You're going to want to probably replace all of your Python, Ruby, and Perl shell scripts. Um, maybe not. You know, maybe you could use Greg's relocatable Python, which is pretty cool. Um, but you may still want to replace these with something else for longevity. And finally, we, as we saw at the beginning, Apple has a history of causing us pain with changes. So be ready to roll with whatever the next big change is. You know that whatever I told you today may not still be the case one year from now. So be ready for that. Don't expect this to be the final word on what you have to do. It's going to change next year. So any questions? So Swift lets you run scripts within it. You compile a program with a script. Yes, yeah, you, you can run a shell script from Swift. Do you still need, if you have that um, signed and notarized, do you still need to have um, full access control of the, uh, the shell, the script shell? Or is yeah, so the signing and the notarization has absolutely no impact on whether or not it has full disk access or scriptability access or any of that sort of stuff. So you have to have both. And if you're running a script, a, a, a Swift um, command line executable through the terminal, for example, the terminal would have to have full disk access if you're going to access, in order to act for that script to access all locations on the disk. And it would also have to have the ability to script something like, say, system events. If your Swift executable is going to use Apple script to, say, grab the login items. So, so in addition to, to notarizing your app, you would also have to have profiles to allow Apple script to? Yep. OK. Yep. okay. Yeah, the profiles are going to be needed pretty much no matter what, unless it's like you're sending it to an end user who's going to click the button in the dialog. OK, thanks. <laughs> I may have missed this earlier, but what is the IR that you're oh, referring to? Oh, IR is incident response. Ah. So um, I, I think some folks might have missed the beginning of the talk. So basically, IR is uh, incident response is just the series of activities you go through when you think a system's infected, and you want to identify what happened, what's installed, you know, what kind of ma is there malware, where is it, what's it doing, that sort of thing. Okay, thanks. Yep. Anybody else? All right. Well, if you have any questions you didn't want to ask in front of the whole group, feel free to corner me somewhere else <laughs> after. And thank you. <laughs>